there's basically two ways when you're looking at making an investment that it makes no sense. Either pricing is so euphoric and so extreme, bubble-esque type characteristics that you kind of scratch your head. And in those cases, you can just take a pass and move on. Or in the other case where the pricing and valuation is so extreme in the other direction that it also makes no sense. And because we invest in auction-driven markets, auction-driven markets have this peculiar characteristic that they can swing quite extremely in both directions. So if I were looking to purchase a home in Clemson or Anderson, basically it would be an intelligent seller facing an intelligent buyer almost all of the time. And you'd come up with uh, some kind of intelligent price in a negotiated transaction. It'd be very similar if you were trying to purchase an entire business. And uh, again, it would be an intelligent seller facing an intelligent buyer. When you have these fractions of business businesses trading on the New York Stock Exchange or the NASDAQ, the fraction of a business can be valued quite differently from the way the entire business would be valued in a negotiated transactions. So when you see those kinds of extremes, and if you had a heuristic which said that that's the only time I'm going to act when I see extreme behavior or extreme situations. So I think in the 2005 annual meeting of Berkshire Hathaway, uh, Warren Buffett was asked a question. He had made a large, a relatively large investment in PetroChina. He had never ever invested in China before. And so his first investment in China, and actually it wasn't that large, it was about a $400 million investment for Berkshire. And so the question came up in the meeting, you know, why do you invest in PetroChina? And Buffett said that uh, at the time, PetroChina was earning about $12 billion a year. It's one of the largest oil companies in the world. I, I think only maybe Exxon and BP would have higher earnings than that. And it's 90% owned by the Chinese government. So 10% is you know, publicly traded and 90% is owned by the government. And against this 12 billion, against this 12 billion of cash flow, the market cap of PetroChina was 35 billion US. And on top of that, Warren said he was grateful that their annual reports were published in English. So he could actually read them. And they had pretty much written black and white in the annual reports that 45% of all cash flow would be pushed out as dividends. So he was buying at three times earnings, pretty dominant oil company. And it was something like a 15% dividend yield on what he was buying. So I think the, the perspective he had is Buffett understands oil and gas very well. He understands these large oil majors very well. And he said that, yeah, if if Exxon or BP or Chevron were available at those valuations, he would definitely pick those because, you know, he would get U.S. governance and many things that he would understand about them that maybe he might not have understood about PetroChina. But he said that given the huge delta in valuations, he thought it was a no-brainer bet. And he couldn't find any other oil company that was trading at those types of valuations anywhere in the world. And I think very quickly, the stock kind of tripled and so on. They've held it for a few years. It was a big home run. That's an example of things not making sense. And so what I would say is that if we practice what I would call anomaly-based investing, weird things happening that make no sense. And that's the only time we acted. So even if we are not doing anomaly-based investing, because we're trying to look into the future, the error rate is high. So even the best investment analyst or best investment manager, according to John Templeton, will be wrong at least one out of three times. And more likely, you'd be wrong at least half the time. And wrong means that you know the stock could flatline and not go anywhere, or it could decline a little bit, or it could go up a little bit, but it doesn't do what you expected it to do. And so we are in a business with a high error rate. And if we focus on anomalies, then those become interesting. And so you need to have your radar up for whenever 
anomalies show up. And I think four years ago, I was in Istanbul and one of my good friends is a value investor based there. So I told him, listen, I just want to visit the publicly traded companies in Turkey that he actually has an investment in. I said, don't take me to businesses that you think are great or whatever if you don't have your own fund invested in them. And so I visited in 2018 and then again visited in 2019 and he took me to a a business. And when we were driving over, he said the market cap was $16 million and the liquidation value was $800 million. I would call that an anomaly, you know, something trading for 2% of liquidation value. So I asked him if it was a fraud and what was going on. And he said, no, it's a very simple business, a very high quality people. My fund has invested in it. And he said, it's basically a REIT. They own warehouses. They're the largest warehouse operator in Turkey. And he said that if they sold all the warehouses tomorrow, they would get about a billion dollars. And there's about 200 million of debt. And so you would end up with about 800 million and the market cap was 16 million. And so then I thought, well, you know, this will probably trade by appointment, maybe not liquid or whatever. But Turkey is an interesting place where it's just a market filled with gamblers. People want to buy at 10 a.m. and sell at 3 p.m. So the average Turkish company cycles through its entire market cap every nine days. In the U.S., if I look at the New York Stock Exchange, it's somewhere between one and two years, more than a year for sure, which is also high, but definitely a lot lower than nine days. And so I found there was a lot of trading volume and for about $8 million, we ended up owning one third of the company. And the Turkish lira has collapsed since then. But in dollars, the market cap is not the 500 million. And that liquidation value is probably maybe close to one and a half billion now. So, so basically when things hit you over the head with a two by four and they make no sense, that's when we need to act. And if someone says, you know, Apple is trading at 150 and it should be, it's worth 180 or 200 or 250, just take a pass. It's not an anomaly. If someone says Apple's worth a thousand per share and it's trading at 200 per share, we should take a look and uh, take it from there. So with that, because we don't have much time, I know that you guys have a limited schedule, uh, limited time. Maybe we can open up for questions and see what you guys want to talk about. Thank you. If anyone has a question, I'll just bring them the microphone. They can ask it. I wanted to know when markets turn sideways, how do you alter your investment strategy? Yeah. So the last six months is mostly a yawn. You know, like I said, you know, we get excited when things are at 3% or 2% of 10% of liquidation value. It really didn't do much for me, if you will. I generally find that in the United States, almost anything I look at, I either find is fully priced or overpriced. And one of the interesting things we had happen in the last, you know, maybe 18 months or so, maybe two years, is that there was a very dramatic change in interest rates, uh, very significant upward movement interest rates. And one thing that should affect stock prices quite significantly is interest rates. And so when we see a huge rise in interest rates like we've seen recently, it should lead to a significant drop in the market caps and valuations of stocks. We didn't really see that drop, which is also an anomaly, but it's an anomaly in the wrong direction. So basically, if stocks were priced to perfection a year ago or 18 months ago, they're definitely overvalued today because we have a huge change in interest rates. And so I think the last six months, you know, for a cheapskate like me, really didn't make much change to the way I spend my days. 
And so, like I said, it's, and the other thing is that in investing, one is, one is far better off not looking at macro events and not looking at, you know, what's the market doing and this and that. Focus on the individual business. Focus. The first question when you look at a business is, is it within my circle of competence? So focus on the businesses that you understand really well and tune everything else out. We don't know what interest rates are going to do. We don't know what the economy's growth rate is going to be. We, we don't know many things. And there's no point wasting time or spending time on those types of questions. And I think what we really should focus on is individual businesses that you understand really well. And then specifically within that group, the businesses which are anomalies in the right direction. Awesome. Thank you very much. I'll go next. So obviously you live in California now, but you went to college at Clemson. How did uh, you make the transition from South Carolina to California? I left California about a little less than two years ago. So now I'm in Austin, Texas. And from South Carolina, I moved to Chicago. And that's where I had my first job in 86. And then in 2003, I moved from Chicago to California. So it's been Clemson, Chicago, Southern California, and now Austin. And I moved to Chicago in 86 when I graduated because I was a foreign student at Clemson. And there were hardly any companies. And, you know, my, my degree was in computer engineering. There were very few companies that came on campus that didn't have a citizenship or permanent residence requirement. There were a lot of defense contractors and uh, like the power company and so on. They all had residency requirements. So I needed a, a company that would sponsor me for a work visa and eventually a green card. And so I was, I was lucky. I found a very good job with a, a wonderful telecom networking company in Chicago. And I worked with them for about three years as an engineer. And then I moved to uh, international marketing with them. So I spent about five years with them and they they got me my green card, which was great. And then I basically started my own company it was an IT services system integration business. And so I quit when that business had a little bit of traction. And then I worked on that for about 10 years and that did well. And then in the middle of all that, I heard about Warren Buffett. And, and then I think in 2003, my wife basically said that this is not a place for humans. It's too cold. And I am moving to California, whether you are or not. And so I said, oh, well, I'll come along as well. And uh, so we moved in uh, 2003, which was a good time. The kids were young. And, and then I think uh, Austin just made sense. Uh, California has the kind of the highest tax rate uh, amongst the highest, probably the highest tax rate in the country, headed even higher. And most of my income comes as long-term gains. And it was like the state income tax was like more than a third of the entire tax bill I was paying. So I said, if the one third goes to zero with what I think is an improvement in quality of life, it's like a win, you know, it's also an anomaly. So we focused on that anomaly and moved to Austin. And uh, there are some really good chefs here and uh, I love the place. It's great. And, you know, UT Austin with the Longhorns, it helps a little bit because they're not orange, but they're burnt orange. So it's close. It's not too bad. And they don't have a tiger, but they have a Longhorn. So, you know, we got to live with that, but that's okay. I was curious on what um, indicators you look for when trying to find an anomaly. Yeah, that's a great question. So basically the job description is reading and thinking. And so I'm, you know, I'm always reading. I'm always looking at different things. And I'm always trying to just make sure that if I encounter something that doesn't make sense, that then I, you know, take a pause and, you know, at least look at what is going on. So, and, you know, these anomalies show up in all kinds of places. I mean, it's hard to come up with a particular pattern, but sometimes you can be proactive to cause an anomaly to show up. So in 2018, I just noticed that Turkey was screening 
extremely cheap as a country, just the, you know, PE ratios and price to book and all of those. So the entire market was screening really cheap. And I actually had a good friend in Turkey who I knew was a hardcore Ben Graham disciple. I'm trying to move him to become more more of a Charlie Munger disciple. And so he's a work in progress there. But he was, he's definitely, he used to come to the Berkshire meetings and all of that. And so I I said, okay, you know, a good way to kind of just uh, poke around in Turkey would be to just go there and look at the businesses he's invested in. And, you know, the food is great. The blue fish that they get from the Bosphorus is awesome. Grilled right in front of you. So I said, you know, the dinners are going to be great. The lunches are going to be great. And in between that, you know, we'll get to learn about a few businesses. And I had no plans to invest or anything. I just said, it's a one week, you know, just great dining and some learning from these different meetings. And that's it. And then when I poked around, we found a few things that made no sense. And so so that's how that happened. And sometimes they show up like, you know, every week. And I think probably at Cooper Library, you have this is every week I I have a subscription to Value Line. And I'm sure Cooper Library has a subscription to Value Line as well. And basically, Value Line publishes every week, you know, this little list. They have like the stocks with the lowest PEs, stocks that have lost the most value in 13 weeks, stocks with the widest discount from price to book. They've got a few stocks with the highest dividend yields. So I just look at those lists every week and it doesn't take much time, probably less than five minutes a week or something. Uh, just to see if there's anything there that pops out. And I remember many years ago, this might be more than 20 years ago, I noticed that there were uh, two funeral services companies that were showing a PE of two. And I had read an article a long, long time before that, which had said that uh, the gist of that article was that the lowest rate of business failure of any SIC code was funeral homes. So if you wanted to go into a business with a high rate of business failure, you would open a bar to compete with Tiger Town. Okay. I don't know if Tiger Town still exists. Maybe you can raise your hand and tell me if Tiger Town still exists. Is it going strong? All right. That's good. So if you open up next to Tiger Town, you might not do so well. You might be in and out of business in six months. If you open up a funeral home or you buy a funeral home, the odds that you would be in business even 50 years after that are really high. And the reasons are that nobody wants to go in the funeral home business. You know, They want to go compete with Tiger Town, but nobody wants to open a funeral home. And basically, it's in a way recurring revenue. Right? So if you have a funeral home in a community, generally families will want to go to the same place. And the other thing is that when your favorite uncle has passed away, you don't call six places trying to get the cheapest price on a casket. You know That's not how you treat your uncle, your favorite uncle. You pretty much call the one place that you know is you know, close and good and you accept pricing the way it is. You know, There's really no bargaining that goes on, if you will. And so that those are all characteristics of a great business. So I said, okay, you know, I know that funeral homes are a great business. Why are they selling at two times earnings? Because, you know, it's so stable. I mean, I don't know who is going to die in Peoria, Illinois next year, but I know how many are going to die, right? So it's a very stable business with very predictable cash flows. And it turned out, so I said, okay, we're going to dig into funeral homes to find out what's going on. And I uh, looked into these two that were trading at two times earning. And basically they had done a big roll up. They had a lot of debt. Even after looking at all of that, that two times earnings made no sense. And so after doing the work, I bought the stock and I was buying at $2 a share. And about a year later, it was $10 a share, you know, and uh, we were in and out in about a year or 18 months. So in that case, it showed up from value line, you know, so sometimes we find things in value line and sometimes we find things. Another place where uh, some of these things show up is 13F filings. 
So, you know, there's professional investors who have over 100 million invested in U.S. markets have to, every quarter, disclose what they own. And so you could look at the Berkshire Hathaway 13F, or you could look at Bill Ackman's 13F, or whatever investors you admire, you can look at their 13F and you can try to re reverse engineer why did they buy that stock, right? So why does Bill Ackman like Chipotle or why does he like the railroads? And uh, I mean, it's in, in many ways, it's investigative journalism, which is a lot of fun. So basically you go down a rabbit hole to try to figure out what was the reason so sometimes when I see things on 13Fs, I'm not really interested in buying or selling or anything. I just want to understand why that particular individual did that. And when I figure out the reason why that person did that, then I can make a decision, well, do I agree with that or disagree with that? Is it enough of an anomaly? What's going on? And then take it from there. So like, for example, if you looked at value line, or even if you look at some of the 13F filings, you will find that some national car dealerships in the United States trade at extremely low multiples currently. You know, in an overvalued market, car dealerships trade very cheap. And, you know, companies like AutoNation, Asbury, Lithia, and so on. And some of them are furiously buying back their shares. Like AutoNation has no dividend. It just buys back a lot of shares. Same with Asbury. And a car dealership is relatively easy to understand. Some of you might have even visited a car dealership or two. And uh, if you've seen the movie Fargo, you know, raise your hand if you've seen the movie Fargo. All right, we've got at least one human who's seen Fargo. Please see Fargo. It's a great movie one of the best movies ever. And with a kind of, uh, I think it's kind of like a dark comedy is the best way I would describe it. But anyway, there's a scene in Fargo where this guy goes into a car dealership, used car dealership. And, you know, he's trying to buy a car. And you know how the sales guy says, when you try to negotiate, he said, oh, you know, I got to go talk to my manager. And then he disappears to talk to the manager. And in Fargo, what happens is he goes over to the other office and they're discussing football scores or what happened that weekend. And then he comes back after five minutes. There was no discussion about any uh, things. And, you know, the back and forth is all a charade. So anyway, if you look at a car dealership, basically, it's three or four businesses in one, right? So there's the new car business. New cars are extremely easy to comparison shop for. And we have many websites like True Car and so on, which will help you understand the invoice price, et cetera. Car dealerships make almost no money on new cars because it's so competitive. People will know what they want to pay, know what options they want, et cetera. You know, it might be like, they might not even make $500 on a new car. So that business is like a loss leader, you know. But when you go buy the new car, they'll almost always get involved in financing it, either as a referral or whatever. And they do make more money on financing and insurance and so on, and warranties and all of that. Used cars, especially, you know, certified pre-driven, that has significant margins because you cannot do an apples to apples comparison, right? I mean, there's a, you know, red Honda Civic, which is, you know, with two years old at 10,000 miles, you really don't have another one that's exactly like that and so on. And especially if the dealer is a Honda dealer and giving you a Honda warranty on a used Honda, et cetera, you know. So, so used cars have better margins. And then the best margins are parts and service, right? And so if you look at a car dealership, parts and service is something like maybe 10 or 15% of the revenue but it's almost 40% of the overall profits. It's extremely profitable because where are you going to go? They know they got you. They know that you got them when you come to buy a new car, but everything else, they got you. And in the US, the franchise laws are such that uh, the car manufacturers uh, are not allowed to sell cars directly. 
and also they really can't really shut you down or anything so these are almost monopolies like if i have a bmw dealership in a certain area a bmw is not going to put three dealerships within 3 miles you know this is not going to do that so in that geography you got like a monopoly so you know car dealerships are a great business but then you know there's this looming threat of evs you know where people think that there'll be a lot of evs which may not need a lot of parts and service but the ev stuff is a little far out and i think now given what the three oems are doing it might be even further out and actually between us girls basically if tesla makes a 10% margin then all the gm ford and stellantis will never make a dime on any evs you know because their costs are going to be much more than 10% more than tesla's so they will want to delay and they are delaying the transitions as long as possible in fact if they were smart they would just run the business in runoff which is not invest in ev um, here's one of the anomalies to pay attention to we have an anomaly called elon musk and when you encounter someone like elon musk there are a few things you do the first thing you do is do not compete with elon it's not good for your health or your wealth you know so we have a anomaly there and so if i was gm of ford or stellantis i was just take my ball and go home i would not play that game and but what they're going to do is they're all going to play the game they'll all lose a lot of money and in the end they will all cease to exist and you heard it first here at clemson so that's just the way it is but in the meantime the car manufacturing is a terrible business car dealerships are a great business and i think the market doesn't get it so that's an you know a little bit of an anomaly so that's kind of how we go about it so you were talking about some of the anomalies for success on like the other hand are there any like strong indicators throughout your career on like what to look for to like when to not buy like a stock for a company and like kind of your way to know when to avoid going in a certain industry or company on its own yeah well i mean you know there's 50,000 or so stocks around the world 99 plus percent of them are either ones that you cannot understand or are too expensive they're not anomalies in the right direction so our main job is to just say no and just say no to everything except every once in a while something shows up that you should look at and then maybe you at after doing the work if it makes sense you say yes and if i can find you know if i can find uh, two stocks a year that i can say yes to life is awesome that's all i'm trying to do even one stock a year would be just fine if i can find one a year i'm doing good and so I focus on talking to the wonderful students at Clemson and avoiding saying yes to stocks to buy because most things just don't make sense to buy. Mr. Pabrad, this is Carrie McMillan with the Wall Street South and we, you always send me great notes and I think the students would like to hear your association with Warren Buffett in Berkshire Hathaway. Well, I don't have any official affiliation with Berkshire or Warren both Warren and Charlie are friends and it's kind of weird that you know the indian guy who was a foreign student at clemson is friends with warren and charlie but you know weird things happen in this world you know that's another anomaly and yeah i mean i think we live in kind of interesting times because we live in the time of warren buffett and charlie munger so i i found that interesting that they were alive and they are alive while i am alive and then i discovered about like i think 16 17 years ago that warren buffett would meet you for lunch if you gave him a bribe you know and i said oh this is great i can try to bribe him and then i can and you know i learned everything you know when i was at clemson i got my degree in computer engineering i tried to take as many classes as i could in the business school 
you know, I spent a lot of time in Serene Hall, but now those business schools move to where Clemson House used to be. And I don't know if Clemson House is still there. It might be gone. It's always gone. All right. Good to know. But anyway, I spent a year living in Clemson House, which was pretty nice. But anyway, Serene Hall was where I used to take my classes. And I really enjoyed it at that time. I took a few investment classes then. But really, almost everything I learned from reading about Berkshire Hathaway and Warren and Charlie and all their writings and annual meetings and all of that. And so I felt like, you know, I think in 2007, my net worth was, I think, 84 million. A very large portion of that was because of using the intellectual property of Warren and Charlie without paying them for it. You know, I like, so I felt like there was a huge tuition bill due. Then I see that he's willing to take bribes. And then I thought to myself, well, you know, if someone makes you these, you know, tens of millions of dollars and, you know, you want to say thank you to them, how much should you be willing to pay them for tuition? And I thought at that time, two million was an appropriate number. You know, I said, you know, if someone makes you like 80 million, you can give them 2 million. It's okay. You know, that's probably a good cheap deal, two and a half percent or something. So I said, okay, I'm going to bid for the Berkshire, you know, Buffett's annual lunch. You can bring seven people to the lunch. And I was going to go with my family. So they were still going to be like three seats empty. So I talked to my friend Guy Spear and I said, hey, you know, I'm going to bid for this lunch. And do you want to come with your wife? for this. He said, oh, I, that'd be great. So I said, look, there are going to be two of you and four of us. So you can be one third of the total and I can be two thirds. And I told him that I was going to, I was okay to go up to 2 million. So with him in the picture, we could go to 3 million. And so he said, wait, that's too much. He said, I can't handle more than a quarter million. I'm good for a quarter million. So I told guy, okay, listen, you're capped at a quarter million and anything above that, which is, I'll take care of, you know, if it's, if the one third is more than a quarter million. And so I bid for it, knowing that we had this $3 million war chest and the the bidding capped out at 650,000. What a deal, you know? And so Guy wired me 200000 and change. And then, you know, we wired the money to this wonderful guy, church in San Francisco, Glide, which takes care of the homeless and so on. It's a wonderful, you know, the movie, The Pursuit of Happiness with Will Smith was about that church and that uh, homeless shelter. So that's where the money went. And, and then, you know, we met Warren for lunch and I thought, you know, my, my only objective for the lunch was that look him in the eye, thank him for his wonderful intellectual property and, you know, you know, go on my way from there. And the lunch went for like about three hours. In fact, he said, you know, I'll stay as long as you want because I've got nothing going on all afternoon. And I think after three hours, we were, we had no more questions for him. We were like exhausted, you know, and, but the, what I didn't expect is the lunch led to a wonderful friendship. And I never expected that. And Warren introduced us to Charlie. You know, I told him that my my wife, Arena, was a big fan of his, but her real love in life is Charlie Monk. And Warren kind of got competitive and said, you know, Charlie is an extremely boring guy. Uh, I'm really the interesting one. And so he said, I'm going to arrange for you guys to meet Charlie for lunch because he's in LA and you guys are in California. And then after you meet Charlie, you will know that he's utterly and totally boring. And then I'm the guy. Okay. So I thought he was joking, but then, you know, I got an email from his assistant and we get lunch set up with Charlie Munger. And I actually enjoyed the Munger lunch way more than the Buffett lunch. It was just great. And Charlie, you can't even bribe, you know, he doesn't take bribes to have lunch. So that was great. And then that led to a great friendship with Charlie until Recently, I used to play bridge with him on Fridays at the LA Country Club. And now he's too old and immobile to go there. So those bridge games came to an end. But I, in fact, I just had dinner with Charlie, I think two, two weeks ago. Yeah, I think about two weeks ago on Saturday. And we had a great time, actually. He's, he's going to be 
100 years old on January 1st and is doing well. And so, yeah, it was a accidental thing that uh, kind of happened. I didn't expect to have a friendship with them. And Warren, Warren ha- used to have this brunch every Sunday in Omaha after the Berkshire meeting. I've been going to the Berkshire meeting, I think, for like 20 six years or something, 26, 27 years. But after the lunch on Sundays, he used to invite us to this brunch. And this brunch was the managers of the different businesses, the board of directors, and some of his friends. So Guy and I used to feel when we'd go for this lunch that we were the only two low life in the room, that everybody else was somebody, and we were like nobody. And then we felt like this would be like the last year we'd be invited because they finally fig- would figure it out that these guys are useless. But sometimes I would tell guy, you know, don't turn around and look, but right behind us, Bill Gates and Bono are having a conversation, you know? And so it was just a surreal experience because there'd be football players there from the NFL and there'd be Hollywood actors and actresses. And then there'd be all these different celebrities and then we'd be the only yo-yos. And so that was uh, great. But anyway, Life is peculiar. Life has anomalies. And we end up with a weird anomaly of the Indian guy with a friendship with these two guys. Life is great. There are any other questions? You got one in the back. How do you go about thinking about like diversification versus betting a large on just a few high quality names you really believe in? Yeah, that's a great question. So Charlie Munger says that if you owned the Ford dealership or you know partially or completely the Ford dealership in Peoria, Illinois, and you owned the McDonald's franchise in Peoria, Illinois, and you owned the best apartment building in Peoria, Illinois, and those were the only three assets you had, and you had like kind of one third in two in each of them. And basically, and you could have partial ownership or complete ownership either way. Let's say those were all listed businesses, for example. He would consider that a extremely well diversified, good portfolio that would likely do really well for you. And so if you think of a portfolio like that, it's all in a single geography, in a small town, and it's in three businesses. So if you were, you know, going to look at a portfolio, of stocks, I think once you get past about 10 stocks in a portfolio, there are diminishing returns. Uh, You're probably going to hurt yourself more than you're going to help yourself when you buy the 11th business, because the 11th business will not be as well understood by you as the number two business in that portfolio. And when you go from 10 stocks to 50 stocks, for example, you don't gain that much with the diversification. So what I have always tried to do in my funds is basically I set an upper limit from a cost point of view of 10% in a single position. and But I don't trim the position if it grows. So like, for example, when we were buying the, the REIT in Turkey, you know, we put, we put the 8 million or whatever in, and you know that becomes 150 million or something it hasn't been trimmed because even if it's valued by the market at 150 million it's actually worth about 4 400 450 million based on the current liquidation value of the business and if i look at intrinsic value which would be even higher than liquidation liquidation value would be even higher than that so in in one of my funds, for example, because of this, the Turkish bets, we've had three Turkish bets. They probably make up like 65, 70% of the pie. But we own the dominant Coke bottler in Turkey. And they bottle Coke in about 12 different countries. If you own a Coke bottler or a Pepsi bottler in most geographies around the world, it's a license to print money highly unlikely you would not do well with that. And and we own an airport operator in Turkey. They operate about like 15 different airports. And that's another monopoly type business that's extremely well. So basically, 
I look at that as like the three businesses in Peoria, you know, and and so that's kind of how we go about looking at things. I've got one. You said you used to hang out at Los Angeles Country Club. What's the best golf round you ever had out there? Well, when I went to the LA Country Club, I wasn't a golfer. We used to play bridge. And I think one of the big regrets I have, I don't have very many regrets, is I should have really focused on golf much earlier. And I took up golf after I moved to Austin. And I, I joined an ice club. It's the 10 minutes from my home. And I don't even know if I have a handicap at this point. I don't think, I don't think it's measurable. But but I have a good time with it. I go to the driving range quite a bit. Maybe if we talk in a year or two, I might be able to tell you that I have a, like a 30 handicap or something. We might get there. We'll see. But I am enjoying it. And the LA Country Club, I mean, it, it actually ho- hosted the PGA this year, I think. And it's a marvelous facility. And Charlie was playing, I think he was playing, he used to play like two times or three times a week. And that would have been a lot of fun if I actually had been smart enough to pick up golf earlier. And if I was really smart, I would have taken it up when I was at Clemson. But, you know, we're old too soon and wise too late. And that's the way life goes. Well, I had a great time. And I think I would just say that I think you guys have a wonderful jumping off point into your careers being at Clemson. And I think that it's, I got a very fine education. I actually never appreciated what a beautiful part of the country I was in till I moved to the other not so beautiful parts of the country. It was wonderful. Some lifelong friendships. Some of my best friends are still the folks I met at Clemson at that time. So it's been great. And I, I encourage you to make the most of it and start the golf as early as possible. Go from there. So thank you very much. 